Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the breakout session on survivor justice, where there will be no singing. Um, instead, uh, my name is Stephanie Carraway, and I will be talking about what we do at the clinic in the survivor justice um, in the survivor justice program. Um, I just want to start with a story about um, one of our clients named Maya, and her name is not Maya. Um, I'm using a different name for her to protect her safety and her confidentiality. Um, and it was a warm day this past February when I went to the Julian Center to talk with her about um, what had been going on um, in her marriage and find out what we could do to help her. And when I walked in to talk with her, um, she came in the room and sat down and we um, contacted an interpreter service that um, we put on a speakerphone. And, um, and that was how I was able to communicate with her. Um, she was not an English speaker and she was not a Spanish speaker either. Um, if she had been a Spanish speaker, I would have been, would have been able to talk with her directly. Um, but we used that interpreter so I could communicate with her. And as she um, answered my questions and told me her story, um, she told me a story about being married to her husband for 20 years and having children with him. And she told me a story of what she had endured for those 20 years. And she had been um, hit and kicked and punched. And she had been sexually abused and she had been insulted and she had been put down and he even went so far as to insult her family and she finally had the courage to get out and say enough is enough and as we talked about her situation and i got information from her i asked her questions um, and as she sat in the chair in the office uh, with me and told me her story um, she sat in the chair with her feet on the floor and her hands in her lap and her head down and she looked at the floor and she never looked at me and she never moved and as she told me everything that had happened occasionally she would glance up at me and then she would just look back down and spoke with me in a very quiet voice and so finally after I had asked her questions and she told me her story, I said, so Maya, what questions do you have for me? And she sat up and looked at me and she said, what will happen if my husband will not give me a divorce? And it suddenly dawned on me that Maya comes from a culture and a background where she's not free to get a divorce if her husband will not consent to it and that she felt trapped in this marriage not only because of the abuse she endured but because she had no idea that she was free to get a divorce if she wanted one that it wasn't up to her husband and so i looked at her and i said maya in the united states of america if you want a divorce you can get a divorce your husband has doesn't have to give you permission and for the first time since she had walked into the office with me, she got this huge smile on her face and she got tears in her eyes. And she said, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And Maya's case is still in process. She's not free yet, but justice for Maya eventually will be freedom and dignity and she will be free of her husband that had abused her for so many years. In the Survivor Justice Program, uh, we serve clients like Maya. Um, we help them with everything from divorce to protective orders to uh, sometimes clients will come to us and by the time we're done talking with them about their legal needs, we find out that they need help with bankruptcy, with housing issues, with tax issues, maybe with expungement issues. And the wonderful thing about the clinic is that we're able to help them with all of those things in one place and we can provide them with holistic legal assistance. 
Um, the other thing that's great about what we do is that we have relationships with partner organizations so that we can connect them with services outside the clinic for counseling, support groups, um, public benefits. Uh, if they are not in a shelter and they need to get into a shelter, we can help them with that as well. Um, and we're able to provide them with services for all of the facets of what a person who's been through trauma needs. Um, so in survivor justice, our clients have been through trauma that most of us, um, praise Jesus, don't, aren't familiar with because we haven't been through it. Um, and so we receive training on how to work with victims of trauma um, and survivors of abuse. And um, as I was reading um, Christina Meredith, our keynote speaker, as I was reading her book, um, she talks about how she too was a victim um, of trauma and how she survived. And she talks about an incident where she was staying with the foster family and there was food in the uh, kitchen and she just wasn't familiar with that. She had never had so much food that she could have as much as she wanted whenever she wanted. And she describes a time where she says, it never once occurred to me that the food in the fridge or pantry would be there the next day. I snuck in there literally as a thief in the night, grabbing what I could keep in my closet. Finding my stash was an awakening for Mrs. Calhoun. It was a glimpse at what trauma does to a person. So when we work with clients who have been through trauma, we have to understand that sometimes they will act in ways that if you haven't been through trauma, you don't act that way. And so we are helping them regain control over their lives, but sometimes they don't understand that they can have control over their lives and they become paralyzed and can't make decisions and we have to guide them through that journey. Um, so uh, as um, we go forward and we continue to help survivors of um, domestic abuse like Maya um, gain freedom and dignity through our work, um, hopefully because you're here tonight, you might be wondering uh, what you can do to make a difference in the work that we do. So um, not surprisingly, I'm going to tell you <laughs> some things that you can do. Um, so I have three ways that you can help us make a difference in the work that we do. The first thing is that we really need prayer. Um, we are engaged in difficult work. It's hard on, our team emotionally, it's hard on our team spiritually, it's legally difficult work, and we really need the prayer back up. Um, if we did not have the assistance of, of Jesus, um, and if the Holy Spirit were not with us helping us, we wouldn't be able to sustain the work that we do. Um, and we just need um, the prayer back up sometimes um we have moments where you know you have these zoom meetings that it's just not the same as sitting down in the same room with somebody face to face um and so we get to feel a little isolated so you can pray um pray for our team pray for our clients um and i think sometimes people think well i'll just pray but prayer is potent the book of James tells us the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So please pray for us. The second thing that you can do is that you can volunteer. Um, we need volunteers in every possible area of talent, skill, ability, and time that you can give. We can use, um, of course, we can use volunteer attorneys to come alongside us and help us with our cases. We can use uh, volunteers for special events like this one, um, volunteers who can help us with language uh, interpretation. We can use volunteers with admin administrative tasks. So if you think you might be interested in helping us as a volunteer, you can go on our website, you can click on menu and then click on volunteer. And there is a lot of information that will guide you through our needs and how you can find out more and become a volunteer for us. Um, I will give you fair warning, however. Um, I contacted the clinic 
um, two summers ago because I thought I might like to volunteer. I felt God was calling me um, to, to do more for his kingdom, and I thought the clinic was a place I could do it. Um, and after having a conversation with Ben Hayes, our volunteer coordinator, um, a couple months later, I was coming to the clinic for my job interview, and then I was walking in for my first day of work as a staff attorney. So um, if you feel God's calling you to volunteer, you never know how that's going to wind up. Um, finally, of course, um, we're here tonight because we're asking you to give of your financial resources. Um, we uh, try to be the best stewards we possibly can with the finances that God has given to us. Um, and one thing that I know for sure is that in the area that I practice in with survivors of domestic abuse, that um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as with most areas of life, things have been, been altered, um, but maybe not in the way that you think. Um, experts agree on a handful of facts. One, experts agree that domestic abuse has um, been on the upswing since the pandemic began because of a number of factors. Um, first of all, um, individuals have been uh, under lockdown, so to speak, and um, being locked up in the house with your partner for hours on end, um, if you are an abusive person, is not positive and it leads you to engage in abusive behavior. Um, two, there has been job loss, economic insecurity that leads to higher stress and that also leads to higher incidence of abuse because people are under higher stress. Third, the pandemic itself is stressful. And that's another factor of stress that is leading people um, to experience higher incidence of domestic abuse. Unfortunately, these factors have also led to a drop in reporting of domestic abuse. The National Domestic Violence Hotline experienced a 50% drop in calls in March of this year, when most states implemented their lockdown measures and um, experts agree that it's because people were unable to get away to make the phone call. People were unable to get away to find a shelter because most of the shelters were closing down and were unable to take new people in because of the, the pandemic. Um, some of our shelters here in the area are still unable to take in new um, survivors of abuse, so we still um, are not fully functioning in that area. So um, I know for sure that in survivor justice, what we're facing um, is going to be a tidal wave once people are able to get away, form a safety plan, and contact us to become free and gain dignity from their abusers. So we need to be ready because we absolutely must help the people who contact us. And with the resources that you provide, we will be able to do it. But we have to be ready for the calls when they come. We have to be ready for all the clients like Maya when they find out that they can be free of their abusers. You can be part of a success story like another one of my clients whose name is Laura. Laura, when I met her, was um, trying to raise her seven kids on a minimum wage job as a cashier in a retail store. Um, I was walking with her through um, a divorce from an abusive spouse. He didn't want to pay child support. He didn't want anything to do with her anymore. Um, and during the time that the case was pending, she did what she had to do. She went to nursing school graduating from, graduated from nursing school, passed the exam to become a registered nurse, and now she is a full-time registered nurse at a local hospital. And when I last talked with her, she was happy. She was able to support her children on the income that she made without having to be dependent on her abusive ex-spouse. She was happy. She was enjoying her children. Um, you can be part of a success story like hers. So we ask that you would consider giving generously so that you can be part of the work that we're doing to provide justice for survivors, which means freedom and dignity. Thank you very much for participating. Um, 
when you're ready, you can either click on the button that says leave a breakout room or the breakout room that we're in will automatically close in about 30 seconds. Thank you again.